Okay, here's an example where we'd like to do a scaling calculation because we'd like to make a model scale test of something really big. In this case, it's a blimp. And the real sized one is about 30 meters long that we're proposing to build. And we expect it to travel at about 6 meters per second through the air. Now, we'd like to figure out what is the drag force on that blimp due to the air flowing around it. And we'd like to do that with a scaling test using a model that's only one meter long. So a one thirtieth scale model. And we could test it in air or we could test it in water. So let's try doing a test in water. And we'll see a little later why that's a good idea. So we've got our 130th scale model in water. What are the important forces? We've got viscous forces are going to be important, pressure forces, inertial, gravitational, and surface. Well, gravity's not really an effect. There are buoyant forces holding it up, but that's not going to have much of an effect on the drag. The surface forces, there's no surface tension here because there's no free surface. So surface tension isn't going to show up as a big uh, item. Now the drag on this blimp, it may be partly due to viscous forces and partly due to inertial forces. Uh, it'll show up as pressure, higher pressure on the front and lower pressure on the back. So we need to track all of these to make sure that we balance them out. So if we want to balance the viscous forces and the inertial forces, then Reynolds number is going to be important. Velocity times some length scale divided by the kinematic viscosity. And it's going to have to be a constant uh, between the prototype test, the prototype scale, and the model scale. Likewise, we're going to have to be interested in the ratio between the pressure and the inertial forces, that's going to show up as our drag coefficient. So the drag coefficient is going to be the same between the two. And it's going to be some function of the Reynolds number and possibly roughness and things like that. So we need to make sure that we make the model exactly like the original, including the surface roughness to scale. If we assume the flow is steady, we'll have no time terms. If we assume it's incompressible, we won't have to worry about the Mach number. No free surfaces, so no surface forces, no fruit number. Uh, from, from the gravitational effects and no Weber number from the surface tension effects. So Reynolds number is the only thing that's going to turn out to be important so we better make the Reynolds number for the model equal to the Reynolds number for the prototype. So the velocity of our model that we're going to test in water times the length of the model divided by the kinematic viscosity in the model situation, so that's going to be the kinematic viscosity of water, must be equal to the velocity for the prototype, length for the prototype, divided by the kinematic viscosity for the prototype situation, so that's the kinematic viscosity of air. So if we rearrange that, we can get that the velocity for the model must be equal to taking the kinematic viscosity across to the other side, kinematic viscosity for the model divided by kinematic viscosity for the prototype, length for the prototype divided by length for the model, and velocity of the prototype. Now our velocity for the prototype 
is 6 meters per second. Length of the prototype compared to the length of the model is 30. The viscosity ratio, kinematic viscosity for the model is the kinematic viscosity for water is about 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. Kinematic viscosity for the prototype, kinematic viscosity for air at atmospheric pressure and temperature is going to be about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared per second. So the ratio of the model viscosity so the prototype viscosity is 1 over 15. So if we plug that in, we get that we should operate the model at 12 meters per second. So twice as fast as the prototype. What's that in uh, units that we understand? That works out to about 43 kilometers per hour. So from a practical standpoint, how would we achieve this? 43 kilometers per hour, we can probably go that fast in a small motorboat. So we might have our small motorboat out on the lake in front of the university. Here's the water surface. We want to tow the blimp down here somewhere. So we could have a line running down to a weight like that to hold it underwater, towing the blimp along like this. And that would allow us to get our 12 meters per second through the water in this direction. And as long as we made this length long enough that the cable wasn't affecting the flow over the blimp, it would be just as if it was moving along through the water on its own. So we know the velocity we've got to test at. If we test at that velocity, we'll have the same Reynolds number. If we have the same Reynolds number and the model's a faithful copy of the original prototype, then we should have the same drag coefficient. So we should find that the drag coefficient for the model is equal to the drag coefficient for the prototype. So suppose we test the model and we find that the force of drag on the model is 2,700 Newtons when we do our test with a little power boat. We'd like to know what is the force of drag going to be on the prototype so that we can size the engines for the prototype. So the uh, drag coefficient for the model will be the force of drag on the model divided by one half rho for the model, v for the model squared, times the projected area for the model. And that'll be equal to the same thing for the prototype. Force of drag on the prototype divided by one half rho for the prototype, so that'll be air, times velocity for the prototype squared times projected area for the prototype. If we rearrange this, we'll wind up with the force of drag on the prototype equal to, the halves will cancel out, and we'll wind up with the uh, force of drag for the prototype, so the density of the prototype will come over here. We'll have density of the prototype divided by density for the model study. V for the prototype, come over here, so we'll have V squared for the prototype divided by V squared for the model. There's going to be a factor of 2 between those two velocities, so a factor of 4 on the square of them. And then we're going to have the projected area for the prototype coming over here, so a projected for the prototype over 
a projected frontal area for the model. Now, density for the prototype divided by density for the model. That'll be about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter for air and 998 for water. That's 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3. The velocity ratio squared, VP squared over V model squared is going to be 6 squared over 12 squared is 0.25. There's that factor of 4. The projected area for the prototype divided by the area for the model, that's going to be area is proportional to length squared. So the size of the model, the model is going to be 1 30th the size of the prototype. So the prototype length squared divided by the model length squared is 30 meters squared divided by 1 meter squared gives us 900 for that ratio. If we plug all of that in, force of drag for the prototype is 0 0.2. 270 times the force of drag for the model. If the force of drag on the model was 2700 newtons, then the force of drag on the prototype should be about 730 newtons. So a lower drag force to pull the much bigger prototype blimp through the air. This is because the water has higher density, so even though the projected area is much smaller for the water, the higher density leads to a larger force. Likewise, to get the same Reynolds number, we're operating at twice the velocity in the water. That leads to a higher force in the water, and that force goes as the velocity squared.